So today, I'm going to finally do another video on the T5 non-world-class transmission. This video is going to be an assembly video of the gear train and the counter gear, and basically putting all the gears in the case, getting it all ready to be buttoned up with the cover, the tail housing, and the front bearing retainer. That'll be for another video. But right now, I'm going to just do that assembly video and get it out to you guys so you can get an idea of how this whole unit comes together. Now, I want to thank everybody for watching and subscribing to my channel. Please do if you haven't. And also that all the wonderful people that have donated to the Buy Me A Coffee Fund. Buy Me A Coffee Funds go into buying gear for the channel and cores and parts needed to put free videos together for you. It's much appreciated. Also, please take the time to read the video description below. It has all my contact information and everything you need to know about me and also about the books that I write. I have a book called Building and Modifying High Performance Manual Transmissions. It's in the link below has tons of pictures on building the T5 especially. It's a good book to get, makes good bathroom reading anyway. Oh, before I go, I just had to show you something. You know, my bench, I'm gonna show you my bench, is not at all organized. I have stuff all over the place. It's just how I work. I never get enough chance to clean anything up. I just don't. I got cameras and tools piled in one bin, chemicals and stuff over here, bits and pieces I might need for builds, all sorts of spare sockets and everything and they're always laying around here and usually what happens is I tend to keep the common sizes and see like I have this socket especially ground kind of keep them on my bench ready to go because I'm always using them and I hate going in and out of toolboxes looking for sockets so I've had this problem where everything is kind of just all over the place and I found these little things here found them in a, a swap meet but they're apparently they're all over Amazon and these are kind of really good because I'm sure you guys already have it and say I have all this stuff like that I just don't but you see now I can just put things how they need to go especially some of the, the fancy tools that I use like I have this special pin that I grind for the shifters now I have a little place for it you know so all this stuff is going to help me be organized a little bit better they're cheap as hell and you can get them on Amazon again and I'm going to start using it and for 2024 I'm, I'm going to try to be more organized I promise you but I just never have the time to sit down sweep the shop or do anything but I'm going to make it a point in 2024 to do that all right so I got everything laid out here just want to show you what I've got I've got first second third fifth gear lower fifth gear upper 3-4 assembly, 5th assembly, sliders. This is an extra slider I dug up for the 3-4 assembly. I had a good usable laying around. The, the one that was on there was kind of beat. This one's got a little bit better point definition, so I'm going to use this one instead. And that's pretty much the upper gear train. Now, let me go grab this gear here. This is the second speed gear. The engagement teeth were pretty well hammered on this gear. Let me just show you up close here. So you can see these teeth are pretty well blown back. Point definition is a little gone on them. We're going to change this gear out. So I got a new one. These new gears have much more beefier engagement teeth, as you can see. These are made in Taiwan. Everybody worries about them, but they are extremely good quality and basically the only game in town. It's a very nice piece. All right. So one thing before you start putting a transmission together, you always want to fit the synchronizer rings to the gear. So what I do is, and the way I do that is I just put the ring on the gear, I apply pressure like this, and I see if the ring locks up on the gear, which it does. Now if I really want to try to apply pressure, I kind of really squeeze hard. I'm putting a lot of effort on this, and it's not turning, which is good. Now to give you an example, Maybe the older ring, which was a little worn, no matter what type of pressure I put on it, I could still spin the gear. Put the new ring on, it really locks up good. All right, so you want to do that to all the rings. Now, usually if there's a problem, usually there are burrs on the inside of the ring over here. And usually I'll go in here with a file and clean up just the edges of the ring, little round rat tail file, and try to get in there and clean everything up. Because sometimes it could be just a little piece of, you know, 
casting flash or whatever just stuck on the outside of the ring and it prevents the ring from sitting on the gear good. Another thing I found is that where the snapping groove is over here that holds the second gear in place, oftentimes this edge gets pounded out against the, the washer that's there on the snap ring and leaves a little bit of a ridge there. So I'll go in there with my Dremel tool like this and just clean up the edges of this piece so that the gear can slide on nice and easy. Oftentimes, you'll put the gear on like this and it'll stop right here and be, be tight, okay? So you want to be able to just slide the gear on nice and easy when you do that. If I feel it's a little bit tight, I'll go in there. You can almost see that it's just it's a little tighter. So I might clean that up a little bit more. But it doesn't really affect where the gear is because the gear is not riding there. But there's a washer and a snap ring again over here. And that is what's going to make sometimes the gear difficult to go onto the shaft. So this inside edge of this always gets banged up a little bit. So I, I clean it up. The other is the slider for one too. Now if you notice you got this hole over here. A lot of people call me up and they say I found a little ball in a spring and I don't know where it goes. It goes in right over here. During assembly, they use that to hold the slider in place on the one two. See, some early boxes, they had a, a slider that fit in here that had a full groove around 360 degrees, and it really didn't matter, and this kind of held the slider in place so it wouldn't rock around. They eliminated it, and obviously somebody must have been in the shooter before because they changed the slider, okay? Because normally if you have the ball and spring that goes in this whole hole here, you're not going to need to use it with one of these sliders. But some people put them in anyway because it helps keep the slider in place and not falling off while they assemble it. But I don't need it. So another thing too is in the new sliders, there's only three positions, if you can see here, for the keys. One, two, and three. Oftentimes people just put the slider on and it's not even registering with the keys and you can get a falling out of gear problem. It's also like that on the 3-4 slider as well. You can see that over there. You can see it's here. one, two, and three. So here's a one-two slider assembly in reverse gear on the outside. And I want you to take note of how shiny the, the shift fork groove is over here. You can see it's beautifully machined. It has to be shiny like that because the shift fork has nylon pads on them. I've seen a lot of aftermarket sliders that are very rough here and then they chew up the pads. So you always want to make sure that when you get a slider that the inside groove of it is nice and smooth and shiny like this so it doesn't prematurely wear out the nylon pads that go on your shift forks. This fits pretty nice on this. It doesn't rock around too much. I like this way this feels. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just move it around to the every three positions that I have here and see how it feels. Right, so here's your one-two slide. I'm going to assemble it. Before I do, again, remember there's only three positions for the keys. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll just put a mark right where it is so I don't lose my place. Then I can see when I'm assembling it how it's got to go. Just about the same. What I'm looking for when I'm doing this is minimal rocking. This way, this feels pretty good. And this way. I'm going to leave this right here the way it is. feels good. It slides back and forth nice and smooth. I like the position of this. I like the way it feels. So as you can see, my mark is right in the middle of that groove. So I know where it's got to go. So if you remember, this main shaft, by the way, was repaired. This is how the repair came out. It's basically a sleeve that was pressed in over it and then reground to the correct dimensions. All right, so what I'll do is I'll take some grease and I'll put them on the bottom and the top of the key for the one, two, and just put the key in place without the spring. Just put it in there like that. So we've got, again, the three keys. They're gonna go here. You could use grease or assembly lube, doesn't really matter. I don't like any of that white grease. Just any kind of mineral-based grease is probably going to be fine. There.
And then what you spring, springs have a tang. Catch the tang on one key, like this. Bring it around so it's under all the other keys. So you might have to push them out to catch it. You might have to do it a few times. That's in there. Now what you want to do, I'm going to flip this around. So you can see the way this key is cocked a little bit down. So what I'm going to do now is put that spring in, in the same direction, but it'll pull the key up there, like actually opposite of one another. So I've got the spring caught inside the three keys. And you can see how the keys now track with the slider. All right. That's what we're looking to do here. Okay, so I want you to notice how these keys are positioned on the synchronizer assembly. If you could see, I put a hook of the spring in over here, and you can see the way it wants to try to pull it around the key. And that's why when we put it this way, we're going to put the hook in the opposite side, even though it's really in the same direction. We're going to put it like this, put it in here, catch it, and that will straighten out the key. Okay, and if you also notice on the fifth speed assembly, you've got a taper side to it. It faces the protruding edge of the hub. So what I like to do is get all my assembly set with the keys and springs all ready to go. The one on the main shaft, and that makes assembly a lot faster. So I'm going to start by putting a little lubricant on the cone of the second speed gear. Put the synchronizer ring on it. Put a little lubricant on the main shaft. Slide the second gear in place. You want to make sure that you catch the slots of the rings within the keys. It's a common issue. People don't pay attention to that and then they put the unit together and it's locked up. So you can see when you have the ring slot located within the key, the ring is not going to rotate 360 degrees. It's just going to index around the, the key like that. So then you've got this hole over here in the main shaft, and you're going to catch the tang of the thrust wash for second gear in that hole first at an angle, drop it down, and then place the snap ring for second gear against that. These snap rings go on really tight. See the way it wants to twist up. Sometimes having a pair of pliers, normally what I would like to do is put this So now that your second speed gear is on, you could put the, some lubricant on the main shaft, like we did on second, drop the third speed gear on with the synchronizer ring, put the three, four synchronizer hub in place, try to catch the splines. Sometimes they drop down, sometimes they need to be tapped on. You want to make sure that the slot of the ring fits within the key on the synchronizer hub. I use an old socket, and usually I can get these down there pretty easy. And once they start, then I'll make sure that the ring is indexed within the key, and then I'll drive it home. Until it kind of bottoms out like that. That's good. Looks really nice. So this is all together now. What we're going to do is flip this around, put first speed gear on, the thrust washer for first speed gear, the rear bearing, and then the fifth speed gear and the snap ring. So when I want to work on the shaft in this position, I have an old sun gear from a 
one of my four plus three overdrives, and it just fits on there perfectly. And that allows me to really lay the first gear on there and work on everything over here. So, same thing, I'm gonna just lubricate shaft a little bit here. Put the synchronizer ring on. Lube the cone of the gear. That looks good. Once that's done, I'm going to put some grease on the thrust washer. These are floating washers. That's how they work. These are floating washers, and that's how they work. They just kind of float on here. The old washers on some main shafts will have a little pin, and the new kits have the later designed floating washer that just floats around. Most bearings you're going to get, good bearings anyway, and good kits, are going to be Japanese. So they're either going to be Koyo, NTN, or usually the popular Japanese bearings. Here you go. Some fifth gears are going to need to be pressed on. And I usually prefer that they press on gears because these transmissions have a tendency to pop snap rings off the fifth gear. So it does go on tight. We're going to have to take this whole thing now and put it in a press. All right, so here's my arrangement on the press. Got the fifth gear supported by some press clamps, gear trains hanging up up here. You're going to see that obviously first gear will drop down. You're going to have to hold it up with the bearing in place like this and then start pressing. What you don't want to do, what you've got to be careful of, is see the way you want to make sure that the way I have it right now, the keys are not connected to the ring. Oftentimes, people will make the mistake and press through and then crush the ring, the synchronizer ring. So make sure that, like that, that the ring fits into the key slots of the assembly before you start pressing on it. That's a good way of damaging the rings and bending the keys. This is a pretty easy press. Now, of course, you don't want to catch your finger here. I'm very careful about where I put my fingers. Okay. It's a pretty tight press, actually. Nice. All right, so before I begin putting the final snap rings on, I just want to go over a common mistake that people make. There are two different size snap rings. There's one for Ford and one for GM. Fords have a 28 spline output shaft, which is slightly bigger in diameter than the GM, which is the 27 spline. If you put the two snap rings next to each other, you could see that the Ford one is just ever so slightly bigger. So if you use a Ford snap ring on a GM, more than likely the snap ring will pop off. So it's very important that when you take apart your transmission, you look at the snap rings. Make sure that you are putting the proper snap ring on the gear if you're using a Ford or you're using a Chevy. It's very important. So now what I'll do is I'll make sure that the snap ring fits in the groove properly. You don't want to be struggling putting a snap ring on there and it doesn't fit. And you don't want to overstretch the snap ring. Just put it in so that you can just open the snap ring enough. Don't overstretch it and let it snap into place. Make sure it's fully seated completely. That's another thing. Sometimes they don't seat completely because they're twisted. So I just go in there with a punch, see that? Make sure that it's seated into the groove properly.
So the main shaft is all together, and I'm not going to put the speedometer gear in place until I actually have it in the main case, because sometimes putting the speedo gear in here and trying to fish the whole main shaft back into the case presents a problem. So now what I like to do is put the front bearing and welch plug back in the case. But I just wanted to go over something again with you, that the old bearing has a little ridge in here that acts like a little stop sealing area within it. This is kind of nice. The new bearings don't. These are kind of like the old style. They never reproduce this one with the ridge. If your bearing is good, this is pretty rusted. You could reuse it, you know, providing that the inside is not scored up or anything. But unfortunately, I'm left with no choice but to use this bearing. So what I do is I use this 518 Loctite. It's the same as the 51813 anaerobic gel. And what I'll do is take this off and put it with my finger in the bore all around. This type of gel is like, think of it as a crazy glue that's in a gel form. So once there is no air, it sets up pretty quick. So I'll put it all in the bore like this. And then I will also put it around the bearing. Now they have all sorts of primers you could use, honestly. I don't use them, it seems to work fine. Never had a problem doing it this way. But if you wanna use something different, that's up to you. But I know this has worked for me for years. Basically, you're gonna press it so it's flush against the case, that's all. Just like that. Wipe everything off. And the inside, wipe any excess that may have come out. And that's good that you see the excess because that means it's doing its job. It's basically just taking up any of the microscopic voids that are in the case. Now what I'll do is I'll put a little bit on the edge of this bore, just a tiny bit for the welch plug. It's like I'm kind of just scraping it with my finger. And drop the plug in. Now this is an expansion plug, so it's curved like this. Once you flatten it, it will just lock in place. So that's how they work. You don't put them in the opposite way. You put it where it's facing upwards the bow, and then you're gonna compress it so it's flat and that will expand the plug and lock it into the case and lock it into the sealant. You could use anything. I have a little piece of old shifter that I use for these things and I just kind of put it in until it's flat. That's nice. Same thing, put it in, make sure that nothing is squeezed out on the inside and that looks pretty good. There's nothing in the inside. What I'll do is sometimes I'll get a piece of, say, cloth like this, go in there and just clean up the bore a little bit. Make sure there's no excess. So I'm in there again, I'm just kind of cleaning out that bore, making sure that it's all good and clear. It looks really good. Yeah, you would see it come up on the, on the rag if there was anything in there, but it's not. It's, it's a nice shape. Now, where do we go from here? We could do a number of different things, but all I like to do is I like to put the cluster in first, then the reverse idle shaft and all of that good stuff. So what we're going to do is put a new thrust washer in. Now, here's the problem. These new thrust washers are a coated steel washer. They don't make lead Babbitt ones anymore. You can thank your Environmental Protection Agency for that. But if this washer is good, then this looks like it's in fairly good shape. It's got a little bit of wear down to the copper, but it's not bad. It would be acceptable to use this again. 
So that's your call. But for the sake of doing a build with something new, I'm going to put the new washer in here. And the new washer you just simply hold in with grease. I'm using an assembly lube, which I can no longer get, but there are other lubes on the market like Trans Gel or Trans Goo. So you want to catch the tang of the washer within the recess like that. So you can see that it can spin, but it's locked in the recess. And put some assembly lube around it like this. Also, if you want, put some grease inside the bearing. You don't have to really pack it tight. It's going to be submerged in oil anyway. But now that it's in on that, what we're going to do is flip it around. So now that the cluster is in place, you want to take the wide washer and put it in place. This is not included in the kit, so you don't want to throw it out. Now, in order to catch the rear bearing on the cluster, you kind of lift it up with your fingers. So I've got my fingers in there like this, and I'm lifting up the cluster. You just kind of catch the bearing on it like this, all right? And I'm going to hold it like this up to, so it, it seats and doesn't cock properly. A lot of times it'll cock and not be right. Then I can drop the cluster back down. So now that I've got this kind of in place, we have to figure out how much has this got to be. In other words, where, how far do we have to put this in here? And there's a thrust washer that goes on the back side of it. <clears throat> okay. And that thrust washer will determine really where it needs to be. So what I do is I kind of tap the bearing down till it's about an eighth of an inch off. That's pretty good. It's like 129. So we're going to leave it at that. See, I just go here like this with some dial calipers and I measure down from here. All right. So the next thing is putting the reverse idler in. So you got the reverse idler shaft, the idler gear, and the O-ring. Slide the shaft in here, catch the idler gear, make sure the teeth are facing towards the pointy section of the teeth and the collar for the fork is facing towards the rear. Put in the O-ring. The O-ring is there simply to keep the gear from rattling against the case or a cushion, so to speak. Then we're gonna put in the the roll pin. These are a little tricky to get in sometimes. I drive the pin in so it's equidistant from the front and the back so everything looks good and it can't rotate. So, so when it's in reverse you see what happens is this kind of goes here like this and spins around. And then when it comes back it doesn't slam against the case. I guess that's the idea. It goes against the o-ring. When I'm installing the fifth and reverse fork, what I do is I just make sure that it feels good, that it doesn't wobble, that it's not worn out anyway. Then I snap in the D-clip for it. And that looks nice, very simple. Next step is to catch the fifth reverse fork on the gear. I'll just grease it a little bit. Put it in like this catch it in here and then put the return spring on the post. Now the return spring is held in place by the rail because the rail goes through the case. So sometimes these rails by the way have a, a hole in the back and a hole in the front. The front hole is usually for a, a port for oil to kind of spill out of. 
So just make sure that you have the proper hole in the right location for the dowel pin for the fifth gear fork. So now I've got everything in place here, it's time to go put the main shaft in. Kind of need clearance obviously for it to hang over the bench and get it in and then drop into place. Now to hold it into place, I'll take the rear race and put it in. I put a little assembly lube on the race. These fit in loose, they don't fit in tight, don't panic. I just notice how I have my fingers here. What I do is I put pressure on one side as I kind of drive the bearing in. That looks nice, all right? Now, several things you can do here. You can put the input shaft in with the fifth speed gear. I like to put the fifth speed gear and work that. So I'll put some assembly lube on it over here. Okay, put the fifth speed gear in place. This will kind of help stabilize the gear train. Okay, one thing I want to show you is this fork is in good shape. It's the old design. The new design has an extra shoulder on it, a little bit longer shoulder to it. So when I have these in stock, I like to use them. It gives the fifth speed fork a little bit more stability along the rail. And we're gonna do is just simply snap in the pads. By the way, I use only the original equipment pads. I don't use aftermarket pads on my builds. So I, any kits that I do put together eventually will have the OEM style pads. Then you want to do is grease the pad with assembly loop so it doesn't burn up on initial fire up, which is fine, like this, and get it ready to go. So the other thing on the fifth speed assembly, this tapered side goes towards the back and you want to put the key retainers in place. There's three slots for them to go into like this. And you just want to press the retainer back into place. So you got to be careful because again, these are not available and you don't want to lose them or anything. So what you do is you put the fork, by the way, the long end of the fork faces towards the front, put the fork in the sl slider and then slide it in as a unit. Some of these go in loose. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that some of the later units don't. And I'm also catching the synchronizer ring within the keys. This thrust washer is not included in any small parts kit, so you have to reuse it. It goes on like this with this little type of clip here. So you need a little tiny pliers to kind of put this on, okay? Usually what I'll do is, if I can't, like I was using these pliers, all right, and trying to get them down, but usually what I'll do is I'll cock it down a little bit and then just try to snap it in place with the bigger snap rings in the gap like this, all right? And it's in place now. So now I'm gonna put in the fifth speed fork roll pin. I put the slot of the roll pin facing forward and I'll just start it like this and then use a bigger punch to kind of drive it all the way through. And of course I'm eyeing it up making sure it's in line with the rail.
Okay. And now we're gonna put the input shaft in. So I use this OTC puller for my uh, jobs. I like this, it's heavy duty, doesn't break. Much better than the Harbor Freight stuff, or though the Harbor Freight stuff will be just fine. I'll leave you some links in the video description. Just gonna put it on the press and just press the bearing right through. So a few things when it comes to pressing the bearing back on here. The bearing is a tapered bearing and it's gonna be press fit onto here. Now, what you don't want to do, and I've seen people do it all the time, is put the race on it and press against the race down like this. So they have it here, they put it on there, and they press on the race like this. That can damage the bearing and damage the race. So what I usually use is a old race from a 308 bearing. It fits on here perfectly. It actually does not interfere with the cage and works perfectly. Or you can heat it up. If you want to heat it, heat it up to about 220 degrees. You usually have a laser gun on it. Heat it and then just drop it in place. That's what I usually do. I just heat them up and drop it in place. So when you're putting these needle rollers in this input shaft here, I'm using that assembly loop again, trying to pack them in there. Put one in. The last one you kind of have to slide in like this. And then they'll stay in place. And then just grease them up. The gear also gets the thrust washer that goes in like this. Put us aside for now. We're going to put the flat thrust washer that goes against the 3 4 hub. And then we're going to put the needle roller spacer, which goes on the tip of the output shaft. And that kind of keeps the bearings from skewing around. A lot of people don't have them in kits. Okay, I order those separately from Tremac. And it took me a long time to do this video to get all these little parts to put this together for you. And I'm trying to get a rebuild kit together in the near future. I put some grease in the key slots of the ring so that the ring will get held in place. I snap it into the key slots, like that. And then the input shaft has usually a little clearance over here. That's to clear the counter gear. And then so I kind of face it towards the counter gear. and Push it in like that. So we got the complete upper gear train in, cluster gear is in, all the forks for the fifth gear is in place, everything's locked down, pinned, ready to go. Bearings are all in place, and now we just have to put the covers on it and the extension housing and the front bearing retainer. And we're going to do that in another video, showing you how I seal it up properly. But right now we get the main guts of the unit together. It's all done. All right, hope you like this video. Please subscribe to the channel. More are coming out coming uh, February. Uh, I'm going to be taking a little bit of break from the business and get back to things hitting it hard first week of February. So thanks for watching. You can please hit me up on all my social media. All the links are below. Thanks for watching.